seeing more of that trio. <laughs> Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to First Chronicles. First Chronicles, chapter number 29. <clears throat> First Chronicles, chapter 29, and I want to bring a message uh, that I think will be a help to you tonight. I don't think I'll be real long this evening, um, but I think this will be a, a help and a blessing as we consider um, uh, giving, giving back to the Lord, serving the Lord, and what the Lord will do or the blessings that we will receive as we give back to Him or give to Him. And so we're going to look at just the first five verses of First Chronicles chapter 29. And so let's all stand together out of respect of God's word, if you are able to. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, First Chronicles chapter 29, beginning in verse number 1. You can follow along um, as I read. The Bible says in First Chronicles 29, verse 1, Furthermore, David, the king, said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God the gold for things to be made of gold, and the silver for things of silver, and the brass for things of brass, and the iron for things of iron, and wood for things of wood, onyx stones, and stones to be set, glistening stones, and of diverse colors, and all manner of precious stones, and marble stones in abundance. Now David has prepared all of these things in preparation for the construction of the temple. David would not build the temple, but he has gathered all these things together that they could be ready for the temple to be made. And then he says in verse number three, Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of my own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for thy holy house, even three thousand talents of gold, of the, uh, of the gold of Ophir, and seven thousand talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the house, houses withal. Verse 5, and the gold for things of gold, and the silver for things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of um, artificers. Notice what he says here. And who then is willing to uh, consecrate his service this day unto the Lord. And David said, we have set everything in place. God has chosen my son Solomon to construct the temple. We've gathered all that needs to be done. Uh, but he said in verse number one that the work is great and Solomon is young and tender. And uh, who is willing right, to do the work? Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our message for this evening. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for all that you have blessed us with, Lord, all that you've given to us and, and so many things we can be thankful for. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the practical application that we can apply into our own lives as we consider these portions of Scripture. And we think of the work that is about to take place under Solomon and under his reign. And we think of, uh, of, of you using him to construct your temple, Lord, and, and how the work needed to be done by many hands. And by many, many people, Lord, involved. Uh, and, Lord, you have blessed them as they served you. And, Lord, help us to see that. And help us to see that you will bless and work in our lives as we are busy serving you. Be with this message tonight, Lord. May we lift you up and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. We see here in the previous chapter, chapter number 28, in these last couple of verses, that God had chosen Solomon, the Bible says, um, in verse number 20 of chapter number 28, and David said unto Solomon his son, Be strong and of a good courage, and do it. Uh, fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. And so God is going to help Solomon and use Solomon to construct uh, a temple, his house, and God will not fail him. God will not forsake him. God will, not, uh, God will give him everything he needs. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee uh, until and he, the work will be complete that he has you to do, the work or the service of the house of the Lord. Verse 21, And behold, the courses of the um, uh, priests of the Levites, even they shall be with thee for all the service of the house of God, and there shall be with thee um, for all manner of workmanship, every willing 
skillful man for any manner of service. Also the princes and all the people will be holy at thy commandment. So we have a construction project that is going to happen. We have Solomon being used of God to, to head this up. And then we have willing, skillful people who are going to, st- who are going to step up and get the work done. And so uh, David makes this, this, uh, this cry here in chapter number 29. This plea for those who will step up and do the work. And that's what he says here at the end of verse number 5. Right? And who then is willing to concentrate his service this day unto the Lord? God's got a job for us to do. The Lord has a, 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 is going to use my son Solomon to, to construct this house of the Lord. Who's going to be willing to step up and who's going to be willing to do this work for the sake of the house of God? And those who do, and this is the message tonight, right? Those who do the work for the Lord will be blessed because of it. Or blessings for those who give back to him or give back to God. We'll talk to you about that a little bit tonight. Choose in your life, think about this now, choose to have the blessings of God in your life. I was talking this morning, I don't know if it was during the Sunday school hour or during the morning service. I I can't remember which it was. I think it was during the Sunday school hour. Uh, But I happened to mention at that time that all of us are going to do something with our days. Right? You're going to wake up tomorrow morning. Most of us will go to work. Most of you go to work and, and do your job. Um, after work, you'll do your thing, whatever that is, you know, head home and spend time with the family or uh, pick up something on the way home for dinner or whatever it is you do. And, and you're going to do something with your time. You're going to fill it up with something uh, over the next week. Every day, you'll be doing something, filling up your time, uh, uh, and, and taking care of your responsibilities. Um, are you going to serve the Lord with that time that you have? Or, or are you going to serve yourself and serve your flesh? And what I'm going to uh, submit to you tonight is that you should choose to have the blessing of God on your life. You should decide, I want to serve the Lord because God blesses those who serve Him. God has a blessing for those who give back to Him. God has a blessing for those who are faithful in the work that God has called them to do. And God puts work in front of us, gives us an opportunity to serve. We can purpose in our heart to do that work, right? And God will bless that. So we can choose to say, Lord... I want to have a blessing in my life. I want to choose that you are blessing and working in my life. How am I going to do that? By serving him. There is a blessing to those who give back to him, give their lives back to him, and and allow God to work in their lives. I've got 10 points tonight. Some of you are like, wow, we don't have much time and we have 10 points. We're going to go through them quickly as we consider out of this chapter, chapter number 29, blessings for those who give back to him or give back to God. What are they? What are the blessings they will receive as we give back to the Lord? By the way, it's Missions Emphasis Month. There's an opportunity for us to give. There's an opportunity for every one of us to serve. Pastor, I just don't know where I should serve. Well, you could serve in giving to missions. It's an area where you can serve. You can do something, right? And you will be blessed in doing so. How's that going to happen? What are they? What are, the, what are the blessings that we have for those who serve him? Number one, okay, being part of something great. You can be part of something much bigger than, than yourself, part of something much greater, part of something much greater um, than what the average person is able to be part of. Notice if you would, verse number one, furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation of, of chapter 29, Solomon my, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender. And notice what he says now, and the work is great. The work is great. It's a large work. It's a, it's a huge undertaking that God's going to have to use many people to pull together to get this done. And you can be part of something much greater than yourself as you serve the Lord. And God's got a plan for your life. And you can say, God, I want to fulfill that plan you have for my life and be part of something much greater than myself. Or you could be self-absorbed. And think about yourself and your, you know, your, your pathetic little life. <laughs> My pathetic little life. I'll include all of us in that. All I do is think about myself. What's, what's in it for me? What can I get out of it? 
I'm offended or I'm upset or I'm, I'm, I, I want this or I want that. I can just think about myself or I can say, God, you've got a much greater plan than my life and, and I want to give my life to you and I want to be a part of a much greater picture, a much bigger work. The work was much greater than one man, Solomon. It is much greater than one person. Um, uh, uh, this is what David's whole point here in chapter number 29 was to challenge the people to step up as, as David himself had used many to gather all the, the materials needed for this building and he was challenging them to step up to be something much greater than themselves. Solomon himself even recognized this and we see this in First Kings chapter number 3 verse number 7 as Solomon begins the work and he says this and now O Lord my God thou hast made thy servant Solomon speaking of himself thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father and I am but a little child I know not how to go out or come in he was humble Lord I need you I need you to use me. I need you to, 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 to control my life and, and use my life in a great way because this, 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 this job is much greater than I could ever handle on my own. And God, I need you to step up and the, the, the work is greater than I am and you can be part of something much greater as you serve God with your life. We can find great purpose in our daily lives. We can find great meaning in our lives as we put God first in our lives and we want to serve Him. So many people in this world, they're all about all they can get. All the material things they can gather. And they're not happy until they have something newer and bigger and greater. Uh, and then they find when they get that, they're still not happy. There's something about a new car, right? There's something about that, that new car smell. You know, that's designed to be that way. They engineer that new car smell. Some of you say, I had no idea what a new car smell smells like, so I've never had a new car. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you get into a new car, and it's got that new car smell to it. And I think auto companies actually make that smell, and they, you know, they actually purposely put that in there. Uh, and you say, boy, this just smells like a nice new car. Everything's, everything's you know, firm and stiff, and the steering's good, and nothing's, like my, all my cars, everything's loosey-goosey, right? Everything's rattling around in there, and, uh, you know, you've got to steer it half a quarter before it starts to respond, you know? Uh, but a new car, and it's nice and new, but you know what happens with new cars? When you buy them, they're new, they got low miles or no miles or just enough miles to get them onto the car lot, so you spend way too much money on a brand new car, and it devalues half its value as soon as you drive it off. You know, but you got this new car... What happens with time? It becomes an old car. And it becomes a not new car anymore. And it loses that attraction. It loses that smell. It loses that shine. It starts to rust and get old and things start to fall apart and the door doesn't work. And you have problems with it. And what used to be nice isn't nice anymore and you're no longer happy with it and you have to get something bigger and better and newer and it is an endless cycle. You can be part of something better than chasing after material things. You can be part of something greater than yourself. You can be part of what God's plan is for your life, all right? We can have daily purpose in our lives as we are part of something greater. Number two, I'm going to hasten on. Uh, blessings for those who are give back to Him, give back to God, right? What are they? They uh, being part of something greater. Number two, having proper affections. Notice, if you would, verse number three, moreover, because I have set my affections to the house of my God. He said, we have a project here of putting together the house of God, and now my affections are set on, on putting together this work that God's called us to do. This world's moral compass is off, and often will lead our affections astray. We find ourselves getting excited about things that really are meaningless, that don't have a lot of purpose, okay? Um, what excites us? What are we passionate about? And this world will make us passionate about things that really don't matter in the long run, that have zero uh, uh, eternal effect. But he said in this verse, I have set my affections. He decided, okay, what was going to be most important. He decided that the construction of this temple of God, that God's going to use his son Solomon to do, uh, that is more important, and my affections will be in the right place because I have set my affections there. I have decided this is what's most important, and I have prioritized in my life. All right, take your Bibles, if you would, um, to Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew chapter number 6. Notice what it says here in Matthew chapter number 6. We'll begin reading together here in verse number 19. And you can turn there and look at the words of God. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. 
But lay up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through it nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's where your affection is going to be. Those things that you treasure, those things that you find most important in your life, that's where your affections are going to be. And what happens is, where your heart is, eventually comes out. Take your Bibles to Luke, chapter number 6. Luke, chapter number 6, verse number 43. Luke 6.43 says, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man, out of the good treasures of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasures of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart... His mouth speaketh. That which you treasure, that which you count close, and that which you set your affection towards will affect your heart and eventually will come out. You can fool us for a while, right? But that which is in your heart will eventually come out. That's the words of the Lord. Are we going to argue with God about this? That which affects your heart will eventually come out, all right? Have proper affections. Decide you're going to set your affections on those things that are right, things of the Lord, serving the Lord, putting them first in your life. We make these decisions every day as we decide what we're going to make time for. Time is a valuable commodity. Time is something that we, we uh, uh, should really uh, covet as, as what we're going to do with that. What are we going to do with the time we have? We only have so much time uh, here on this earth. And by the way, we don't know when that time will come to an end. You're not guaranteed anything. And with the little bit of time you have, that vapor of time, the life of a vapor of time you have, what are you going to do for the Lord? Are you going to set your affections on things that are right? Having proper affections. Number three, we hasten on. Okay? So here we have, we're doing the work of God and, and, and what God's going to bless us with as we serve Him and, and give back to Him. Right? Proper affections. We're going to have being part of something great. We're going to have proper affections. Number three, having a personal stake in the work. And I want you to notice what happened here. Uh, in, in First Chronicles chapter number 29, a personal stake in the work, okay? Verse number 3 says, Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God. All right? I, I, have, I have purposed in my heart. I have set my affection into the house of my God. Notice what it says here. I have of mine own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God, over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, even 3,000 talents of gold and of gold of over and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the houses therewith. Much of what David was giving was of his own personal good. And he said, I'm going to have a personal stake in what is happening in this. I'm going to have ownership of what is happening in God and the ability God's given to me and the, the work God's given me to do. We should have a sense of ownership. Now get this. We should have a sense of ownership in our church and in the area God has called us to serve in our church. Right? God's called you to serve in a certain area. God has an opportunity for you to serve. Maybe you say, boy, I just don't know what God would have me to do in our church. And boy, we'd love to find an area for you to serve in your church. Now, what are you going to do with that area you have to serve? No matter how small it is, no matter how big it is, it's an area you can serve. As you are serving in that area, you should say to yourself, this is what God's called me to do. I'm going to focus in that and I'm going to take ownership of it. What if I'm not there on a Sunday and I'm teaching a Sunday school class? What happens? It's, it's, a, it's a void that needs to be filled. Why? Because you're taking ownership of it. What if I'm not there to, uh, uh, to step up and, and be where I'm supposed to be and in my place and, and I can't be there for some reason or another? Uh, someone else is going to have to step in there. Something's going to happen because I don't just flippantly do this. I can't just go with or without it. I have to be there. Uh, uh, the Lord has put this in my life and I, I made a big deal about it and I'm going to put a lot of effort into it so that if I'm not there, it is a void that needs to be filled because I'm going to take ownership of, of that responsibility God's given to me and it's not just for the pastor preaching behind the pulpit.
pulpit. It's for everybody in every job that you do, whether you're an usher or a greeter or a junior church worker or a Sunday school teacher or working with the youth group or working in the Christian school or whatever it is, you take ownership of that job that you have and you say, God, I'm going to do the best job that I can at it. I'm going to put a lot of effort into this because this is what you give me to do, Lord. Take ownership of it, right? Having a personal stake in the work. David didn't just give instruction for them to do stuff. He personally put time and effort and goods and money of his own goods into what was happening there, right? How are we? Blessing for those who give back to him. Being part of something great. Having proper affections. Having a personal stake in the work that is happening. You could say, you've done that part. Someone say, boy, God has sure blessed Berean Baptist Church. And you can say, you know what? I've done my part. God called me to my little area in that church, and I'm serving faithfully. And this church is only great because of the people that are serving here and because of the God that we serve. And everybody who's serving is doing their job and doing a great work. And no matter what it is, how simple it is, you do your best job at it, and God will use that. Number four. What are they? What are the blessings that God's going to give okay, to those who serve him? Number four, a willing heart. I want you to notice now we saw David described what he's gathered and put together. Verse number five, he talked about the gold for things of gold and the silver for things of silver. And for all manner of work he made um, by the hands of um, art artificers. And, and, and who then, notice what he says now, and who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord. I want you to notice now verses number 6 through 8. As he put forth that challenge, what happened? What was the response to that? Verse number 6. Then the chief of the fathers and princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of thousands and of hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly and gave for the service of the house of God of gold 5,000 talents and 10,000 drums and of silver, 10,000 talents, and of brass, uh, 18,000 talents, and, and 100,000 talents of iron. And they, with whom precious stones were found, gave them to the treasure um, uh, of the house of the Lord by the hand of um, Jehiel the, the Gershonite. So here we have those that with a willing heart gave. The end of verse number 6 says, offered willingly. They said, all right. There's a job to do. There's a work ahead of us. God's laid this out in front of us, and I'm going to do it willingly. I talked this morning about Exodus 25, when God commanded the people to bring stuff to Moses so that God, Moses could construct the tabernacle. And, and those who had the talents and ability could construct the tabernacle, same thing. But God told them to come and bring it with a willing heart. Now, all the difference in the world. We can give Right? We can give grudgingly, we can give upset, we can give, I don't want to give, but I suppose I should. You know, kids are watching, better do something. <laughs> or we could do it willingly and say, God, I know you're going to bless. I'm going to give. God gives commands, but expects a willing heart. We saw that this morning, Exodus 25. Number five, we hasten on. Give blessings for those who give back to him or give back to God. Number five, um, a great occasion for rejoicing. Notice, if you would, verse number nine. It says here, Then the people rejoiced, for that they offered willingly, because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. There was great joy as they all offered willingly and said, I can do something for the sake of the temple and for the sake of serving God. And praise the Lord, we're going to see something happen. And they rejoice in the fact that something is being accomplished. Now, as much, and I, you know, I've shared this here before, as much as we do great things for God around here, and, and by the, I should say this way, as much as God uses us to do great things for his purpose, right? God does great things, but he uses us to do that, and we're very thankful for that. And as much as we have seen the Lord do great things here, you know, our mission's emphasis month in the past. The other day I was writing a list of things we have done in the past as far as raising money for a special project. Um, a couple of years, a few years ago, we, we raised money to, to send a bunch of money for the boat ministry up in Greenland. Remember that? We, we sent them, I want to say, what was it, over $4,000, $4,500 we sent over there to help them with their boat project. Remember he gave us a list of a bunch of things that he thought maybe we could hit one of those things, and, and by the time we raised enough money, we could cover it all plus some, and what a blessing that was to be to them. 
Um, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, we, we sent some money for Sammy Rogers to get a car, to pick up a car down in Brazil. Um, we sent a barrel to the Ghana team in, in Kamasi. Um, all the things that we've done, and, and there's several other things that I wrote down that we've done in the past as far as raising money. And we helped Brother Good Pastor with his son and some of the expenses that they had, the medical, medical expenses they've had. And, and those things, those goals that we've had, and, we, and we've seen the Lord do a work through that. If we raise money as a church, we're excited that you know, we, we get that last day and we announce how much money we've raised. And we say, praise the Lord, God's used our church in a great way to do that. I sometimes sit in the back here in the, in the pew after announcing that kind of thing and I look out at the church and I think of those people who were not here for any of it. People that they call this their church. Man, they, 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 they claim they love the Lord and they want to be serving the Lord and they didn't show up one time during the entire missions conference. Some people not even during the whole entire missions month. They would have no idea we even have flags up in the auditorium. And they miss all of that. They're not part of something greater than themselves. They're not part of, of God doing a good work because their, their lives are very self-centered and they're not part of that great rejoicing that we have together as a church when we accomplish a goal of raising money or, or whatever the goal happens to be and, and God does that work through us and we rejoice together over that. And there are those who miss out on all that. Don't miss out on that. Don't miss out on that rejoicing, the great work that we can do together that can bring great rejoicing, all right? Number six, we understand that God gets the glory. Notice what it says here in verse number 10 through 13. Wherefore, David, bless the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the, great, uh, uh, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted um, uh, 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 as head above all. Notice verse number 12. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all now therefore O god we thank thee and praise thy glorious name and they gave god the glory for all that had happened there in all situation god gets the glory no matter what happens we say god you get the glory for all that is done and sure maybe we'll be, raised, be able to raise the money uh, we need for that little church in barracuma and, and we'll raise that two thousand dollars and maybe even far beyond that two thousand dollars but none of us can say wait boy I did a great thing we can all say and rejoice together that God has done a great work and God gets the glory Number seven, we hasten on. Blessings for those that give back to him. Number seven, we are humbled at the opportunity. Notice if you would verse number 14 and 15, but who am I? As David continues to speak, he just got all this glory to God for all that he had done, but then he says here in verse number 14, but who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, and of thine own uh, have we given thee. For we are strangers before thee, and sojourners, as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. David said, who am I? I am nothing, and God is everything. We humble ourselves. We are... Uh, what uh, God uses of us. Take your Bibles, if you would, quickly to 1 Samuel chapter number 15. 1 Samuel chapter number 15, and I, I hasten on, we're quickly running out of time here. You remember 1 Samuel chapter number 15, this is when Saul was disobedient. He did not obey like he should have. God commanded Saul to um, destroy them. Verse number 9 says, But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. So he did not destroy them like he was told to. In fact, verse number 3 says, Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have. That was the instruction that they got. However, they did not destroy all of them. And so you remember Saul uh, was disobedient to the Lord. Verse number 22, uh, Samuel had to confront him and told him that he needed to be obedient to the Lord and that obedience is better than sacrifice and uh, uh, to hearken than the fat of rams. And uh, what an important lesson we learned there. But in this confrontation that Samuel had with Saul, he made an interesting statement about Saul. What happened to Saul? Why is he not obedient like he should have been? Why is he not following God's full instruction like he was supposed to? Plain language, he was getting too big for his britches. Now notice what Samuel tells him. 
Um, uh, see verse number 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said unto me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. He said, When you were little in your own sight, when you were humble, when you didn't think of yourself as being such a great guy, when you didn't take so much credit for the position you were in, when you were little in your own sight, that's when God made you king. Right? We humble ourselves, as David did in Second Chronic, First Chronicles uh, chapter number 29. And he said, after all this praise to God, he said, Who am I? And he, he humbled himself. We hasten on. All right, we were humbled um, at the opportunity as we serve the Lord. What blessings do we have? We were able to humble ourselves at the opportunity to serve the Lord. Number eight, we realize where the blessings come from. Verse number 16, O Lord, our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee and house for thee, thine holy name cometh of thine hand and is all thine own. God, everything we have. Now, David could have easily taken credit for all that he was able to gather. In fact, if you look at how he gathered some of the stuff, he had allies those he had teamed up with that were able to ship him some of the, the type of wood that he needed to build this and construct this. Uh, and David had alliances with certain people that would help him uh, gather all that was needed. And he, and he could have taken credit, but he didn't. He said, all of this is because of you, God. And, uh, uh, and we realize that where our blessings come from is often the ones who are serving that see where the blessings come from directly from God. Uh, and I must hasten on, number, number nine, we have our hearts tested, and we pass. Notice verse number 17, And I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart, and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and now have I seen with joy the, thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee. We can pass the test. God can use us. Number 10, we provide for a legacy of faith. Verse number 18, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, and our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination and the thoughts of the hearts of thy people, and prepare their heart unto thee. And give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart, to keep thy commandment, thy testimonies, and thy statutes, and to do all these things, and to build the palace for that which I have made provision. David said, I've done what God has called me to do. I'm taking that which what I've done, and I'm handing it to my son Solomon. Solomon will construct the temple, and it will be a legacy, a legacy of faith for the next generation. Now, as we serve God, <clears throat> we serve the Lord and, and, and seek out his will and do his will, right? There are blessings that come with serving him. A life that will be looked back and say, we don't have any regrets. We're, we're thankful that we serve God. J.L. Kraft, head of the Kraft Cheese Corporation, who had given approximately 25% of his enormous income in, Christ, in Christian causes for many years, said, <clears throat> the only investment I ever made, which had paid consistently increasingly increasing dividends, is the money I had given to the Lord. J.D. Rockefeller said, I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars I ever made if I had not tithed my first salary, which is $1.50 per week. As you've served the Lord and put him first and consistently given to him, God has never let them down. God will bless us. God will give us a blessing as we serve him. Many blessings we talked about tonight and so much more, but we must keep him centered, must keep him first, must be faithful to him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your word tonight. Lord, I pray that you would help every one of us, as, as David recognized here, that you gave him the ability to collect and put together these things to construct the temple. And that you would use his son Solomon to head this up, but there was a need of people who were willing to work. And Lord, you saw, we saw how they rejoiced and they gave you the glory as the work was going to be done. Lord, help us as a church and as individuals serving you to get busy and willing to serve and work for you, knowing that you'll do a great work in our lives. And just a moment, we're going to give an invitation. Maybe God spoke into your heart. <clears throat> Maybe there's an area where you need to serve the Lord.
God's prompted your heart about getting involved in some way and you need to do something for the Lord. Maybe tonight you need to come to an old-fashioned altar and say, Lord, I'm going to serve you in this area that you brought to my mind. Maybe someone says that, you know, God's not brought anything to my mind, but I just, I, I want to be willing and I want to serve him. And maybe you just need to come to an altar and say, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever did you have me to do. I'm going to surrender my life to serving you however you see fit. That's a, that's a, that's a tall order. It can be difficult words to say if you think about the possibilities, but we all ought to be willing to say, God, whatever it is you want me to do. Maybe this altar will be open for you for that. Maybe there's someone here and, and, and God spoke in your heart about something. It has nothing to do with what I said, but you just know you need to come to an old-fashioned altar and spend time with the Lord. This altar is open for you. Let's all stand together as we stand. The piano begins to play. As the piano begins to play, as God spoke into your heart, you need to make a decision. You come forward.